Hello and welcome to the Capitol Report. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Steve Lance, and here are some of the top stories we've been following for you today. The mayor of a Texas border city where thousands of Haitian migrants have camped out in recent days says it's now empty. Meanwhile, the Biden administration faces pressure from both sides of the aisle over the border crisis. We sit down with Congressman Mo Brooks to unpack why Washington's spending spree matters to the average American, and we get his take on the ongoing border crisis. The House today passed a new national abortion law that would allow abortions up until birth. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was challenged on her views as a self-proclaimed Catholic. We have her response. The mayor of Texas border city Del Rio said at a news conference Friday the camp in Del Rio that was housing thousands of illegal Haitian immigrants is now empty. Just days ago, nearly 15,000 people from the Caribbean nation were gathered under the bridge. As of this morning, there are no longer any migrants in the camp underneath the Del Rio International Bridge. Officials said about 1,400 of the nearly 15,000 have been sent back to Haiti. Another 3,200 transferred to other Border Patrol holding facilities for processing, and several thousand have returned to Mexico. They also said the DHS is working with other countries to take in some of the Haitians. In photos taken at the scene in Del Rio, many Texas Department of Public Safety vehicles were parked along a road near a waterway. Texas Governor Greg Abbott said these vehicles create a steel wall to prevent illegal immigrants from crossing into the United States. Meanwhile, the Biden administration faces pressure from both sides of the aisle over the border crisis. It's like I'm in bizarro world. I see it in front of me, you see it in front of you, but we pre some people pretend not to see it. I'm unhappy, and I'm not just unhappy with the cowboys who were running down Haitians and using their reins to whip them. I'm happy with the administration. On Thursday, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said horse patrol will be suspended at the Haitian camp. President Biden's special envoy to Haiti, Daniel Foote, announced Thursday he's resigning in protest of the large-scale deportation of Haitian migrants. Of course I take responsibility. I'm president, but it was horrible what to see, as you saw. To see people treat it like they did, horses barely running them over, people being strapped, it's outrageous. With a government shutdown looming and the crisis on the southern border, we sat down earlier with Congressman Mo Brooks of Alabama to get his take on all of this. Here's what he had to say. So why is the debt ceiling so important? It is the one leverage item we have to force debt junkies, Republicans and Democrats, they're bipartisan debt junkies here on Capitol Hill. It's the one point we have in this process to try to force them to be financially responsible. Yeah, this isn't something that's just related to uh, Capitol Hill and, and, and politics. This affects everybody. Think about the United States of America going bankrupt, which is where we're headed, with an absolute certainty if we don't change our conduct. Our Comptroller General of the United States has warned us repeatedly in writing that our current financial trajectory is unsustainable. That's accounting language for a bankruptcy is on the horizon unless you start doing better. Now think about how it's going to impact your life if all of a sudden there's not money to pay for Social Security or to pay for Medicaid or to pay for Medicare or to pay for national security. So we need to be much more diligent and long-term thinkers up here on Capitol Hill if we're going to avoid this tragic mistake. Now, Congressman, I just want to switch gears for a moment and ask you about the uh, ongoing border crisis. Uh, the U.S. Special Envoy to Haiti has just recently resigned, um, saying that uh, the U.S. policy to Haiti is, is deeply flawed. So he's doing this in protest. Um, what's your thought on the current situation on the border? Let's be real clear when we're talking about what's going on on the southern border, when we're talking about our immigration policy, America's lawful immigration policy is the most generous and compassionate on the planet. Our lawful immigration policy, by way of example, we give more citizenships than any other nation on earth. That's the highest honor that one nation can give to a foreign-born individual. In fact, we almost give as much in the way of citizenships each year as every other nation on the earth put together. 
So the illegal immigration problem is on top of what is already a very, very, very generous, lawful immigration policy in the United States of America. The long-term effect of this is you're going to see more killings of Americans on American soil by illegal aliens. Right now, roughly 2,000 Americans are dead each year, killed by illegal aliens on American soil. That number is going to go up. You're going to see more and more Americans seeing wage suppression. This is what the Chamber of Commerce wants by way of example. They want this wage suppression caused by a huge tsunami of cheap foreign labor workers. You're going to see Americans losing jobs, particularly at the blue collar level. You're also going to see that the welfare net that we've established is going to be strained because we don't have enough money to pay for the living expenses of everybody who wants to break into our country. Now, you just sort of touched upon it. If you could just break it down quickly for us. You know, Democrats say that the United States has a responsibility to allow those from other countries uh, that are facing hardship um, to come into our country. Can you put that into context? You, you just kind of did, but can you break it down a little bit further? Our first and foremost responsibility is to American citizens. Yes, we can bring in foreign-born individuals as we can absorb them and as they are self-sufficient and they are productive members of our society. But when we bring in people who cannot speak the American language, who don't have skills demanded by American employers, and they immediately go on welfare, that's hurting our country. That's not lifting our country up. By way of example, we had almost two centuries of immigration policy and history to look at. And for almost two centuries, since the founding of the United States of America in 1776, people who came to our country, you know what? They didn't get welfare. They had to be self-sufficient. They had to take care of themselves. But nowadays, that is not what's happening. And every time American taxpayers have to fork over some money to a city or a county or a state or the federal government to take care of immigrants that we don't have the capacity to absorb into our economy, that diminishes the life the capabilities, the standard of living of those American citizens. So yeah, let's be compassionate, but let's also be rational, and that's, let's not do damage to American citizens and lawful immigrants like we're already doing. Congressman Mo Brooks, thank you. My pleasure. And Florida is following Texas's footsteps on abortion. A state lawmaker this week just introduced a bill to ban abortions after six weeks of pregnancy, allowing citizens to sue anyone who performs an abortion in violation of the law. State Republican Representative Webster Barnaby introduced the heartbeat bill, and Governor Ron DeSantis said he'll sign it if it gets to his desk. The bill has already met with Democrat opposition. Florida's Democratic State Representative Anna Escamani says it would cause some Florida women to seek unsafe options to abort their babies. Both the Florida bill and the new Texas law are strict efforts to restrict abortions. Texas is being challenged by the U.S. Department of Justice, but the U.S. Supreme Court has let the Texas law stand for now. On Capitol Hill today, the Democrat-led House passed a new national abortion law. This is in response to a new restrictions on abortions in Texas. NTD's Melina Wisecup joins us now to discuss it. Melina, what's in this abortion bill and did this bill pass on party lines as expected? Steve, the House did just pass that national abortion bill this afternoon, and as expected, it did pass along party lines with Democrats supporting it and Republicans opposing it. Now, one Democrat did join Republicans in opposing it. That's uh, Representative Henry Cuellar from Texas. In this new abortion bill, it would allow for abortions even after fetal viability. Now, that's a medical term that um, means when a baby is considered alive or capable of living. Another interesting thing to point out about this bill is that it, uh, lawmakers who are supporting it say that it's their duty to restore access to abortions through undoing obstacles. And one thing that's targeted in this bill are parental consent laws. Uh, laws that require parental consent for abortions are deemed as, quote, obstacles for abortion access. Steve? We know House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has been rallying support for this bill all week and she's defended her support for the bill. This comes after an archbishop denounced it as a child sacrifice. How did Pelosi respond to this criticism from a religious leader in her own district? 
Yes, Steve, so Pelosi was pressured this week to respond to those comments by the Archbishop. Now, the bishop and his criticism of this national abortion bill didn't specifically name anyone, but he, he did say that he feels it's shameful for any self-proclaimed Catholic to be supporting an abortion bill, one that he calls evil and deceptive. Now, here's Speaker Pelosi's response to the, the, Archbishop, the Archbishop's comments. Yeah, I'm Catholic. I come from a pro-life family, not active in that regard. The Archbishop of the city, uh, that area of San Francisco, and I have a disagreement about who should decide this. Now, we know some moderate lawmakers have said that they oppose this bill because it goes further than Roe versus Wade. Specifically, you have Senator Susan Collins from Maine, who actually wants to join Democrats in strengthening Roe versus Wade. But she says this bill goes beyond that, saying it would, quote, severely weaken the conscious exceptions that are in the current law. Melina, what is Senator Collins referring to here by weakening exceptions in Roe versus Wade? Yes, yeah, Steve, specifically what Senator Collins is referring to is that she says this bill would weaken the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Now, that's a law that protects doctors' ability, anyone's ability, really, but in this case, doctors' ability to refuse to to refuse performing an abortion if it conflicts with their own personal religious beliefs. Now, this bill will not be signed into law anytime soon. The Senate doesn't have the Republican votes needed in order to pass it, so it will not get to Biden's desk anytime soon. The reason the Democrats in the House wanted to push it through was simply for political symbolism. They wanted to really show their stance on abortion and show the American people that they strongly oppose that new Texas abortion law. Another thing to point out about abortion laws on a national scale is that the Supreme Court in December will take up a case that will determine the fate of Roe versus Wade. We'll see how the courts rule on this and if that Roe versus Wade case is overruled, it will be a huge change for abortion laws across the country. Steve? Thanks, Melina. The White House and congressional Democrats have agreed to a framework to pay for the $3.5 trillion Build Back Better Act. The White House, the House, and the Senate have reached agreement on a framework that will pay for any final negotiated agreement. We are writing legislation, and, it, and when you're writing legislation, you have to be specific. And this is what took us a long way to a framework. Now, again, at a weekly so press conference right. Thursday, Pelosi and Schumer were joined by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen when they made the announcement. The White House and congressional Democrats have agreed to a framework to pay for their huge emerging social spending and Green New Deal bill, but they offered no details. Democratic leaders and President Biden have said the measure will total $3.5 trillion over 10 years. American workers who filed for unemployment increased more than expected last week. The number hits the highest level in over a month. The Labor Department says that 351,000 people have filed for unemployment benefits last week. That's an increase of 16,000 from the previous week. This is the highest number of weekly claims since August 21st. At Penn State University, more than 100 unvaccinated students have been suspended for missing weekly COVID tests. The pandemic is making teacher shortages worse. Several schools nationwide have had to close or go back to remote learning. Under the Biden administration's direction, the intelligence community has conducted a study around the origins of the CCP virus. GOP Congressman James Comer says the investigation has only caused more confusion. We had a chance to ask him what he means. Penn State University has suspended over 100 unvaccinated students because they have missed weekly testings for three weeks in a row. Students are not allowed to take classes in person or remotely. They're also not even allowed to be on campus. According to AP, among 50 of the largest public universities in the country, 24 of them are enforcing vaccine mandates. Most of those schools are located in the Northeast and California. While in Florida, a new order is making quarantine optional for students who have been exposed to COVID-19. Public schools have long struggled with a teacher shortage. Now the pandemic is making it worse. A school district in Idaho has been temporarily closed due to low staffing. 
The Filer School District is closing starting today due to not having enough teachers to staff the classrooms. They are hoping to reopen by October 4th. California, New Jersey, Tennessee, and some other states all face the same issue. Several schools have had to shut down classrooms nationwide, while some have had to move back to remote learning. According to a survey done in June, over 30 percent of teachers plan to leave their jobs earlier than the expected time due to the pandemic. United States Congressman and ranking member on the House Oversight Committee, Representative James Comer, recently sent a letter to the Director of National Intelligence requesting all raw intelligence related to the Biden administration's 90-day investigation into the origins of the Wuhan coronavirus. Congressman Comer said that this investigation has only served to cause more confusion. We spoke to the congressman earlier to find out exactly what he meant. Congressman James Comer of Kentucky, ranking member of the House Oversight and Reform Committee, thank you for joining us on the Capitol Report. Thanks for having me on. Now, Congressman, I want to ask you about a letter that you wrote to the Director of National Intelligence. You said in the letter that the review they conducted regarding the evidence related to the origins of the Wuhan coronavirus has only caused more confusion. Can you tell us what you meant by that? Well, I think that uh, more and more evidence is coming out to prove that this virus was uh, manufactured in the Wuhan lab. Uh, but the Biden administration intelligence community, the Biden administration uh, uh, healthcare community, they're all trying to punt on this and say, well, we can't find any information, let's move on, any evidence, let's move on. And you're seeing more and more medical journals come out uh, and, and amend their earlier statements where they said that uh, this came from uh, animal to human. Now they're, they're uh, covering their tracks saying this, you know, very likely could have been engineered in a lab. So it's just very disappointing to see the Biden administration not want to determine the origination of COVID. They're not pressing China. They're not trying to hold China accountable for covering up early evidence with respect to their gene, their initial gene sequences uh, with regards to the work they were doing at the Wuhan lab. So uh, we're not satisfied with this, the Republicans on the committee, and we're going to continue to press forward and demand that the Biden administration uh, try to get some more information out of China. Now, you've requested all raw intelligence that was used to reach their conclusions. What do you think that story might be able to tell or not tell for that matter? Well, my concern is they didn't uh, lift a finger to try to find out any information. You know, the longer we wait, the more China can cover up. Uh, China's military already went in there early on and covered up a lot of information. That we do know. Uh, that is common knowledge. But with respect to uh, what was going on, the purpose, you know, the emails that have, have come out recently with respect to the lab was wanting to inoculate some bats in the, in the cave to try to prevent a COVID outbreak, you know, wh whatever was going on in there, uh, it was no good. It was unethical. Uh, there shouldn't have been any tax dollars from the United States going to fund that. Unfortunately, we've proven that there were. I believe Dr. Fauci know, knows a lot more about what was going on in there than he would like to imply when he stands before the mainstream media and uh, continues to uh, deflect on the origination of COVID. So we would just like to see exactly what information the intelligence community requested from China. Who exactly did they talk to in China? Obviously, communist China is going to say, no, no, it didn't come from us. It came from a bat although we haven't been able to prove that. It, it certainly didn't come from the Wuhan lab. Well, then the next question would be, what exactly were you doing in that lab? And if the intelligence community didn't even ask those questions, then uh, that's going to be pretty disappointing. But that's my fear that uh, Joe Biden and uh, his friends in the deep state just said, uh, let's just turn a blind eye on this and let's, let's focus on something else. Yes, that's a, that's a great point. Dr. Fauci has been on the record vouching for Chinese scientists, his, his counterparts in China, uh, for their credibility. And, you know, it's quite common that the CCP turns ordinary citizens into de facto spies, let alone the scientists at the National Institute of v Virology. Um, at the very least, they're surely uh, towing the party line. Now, um, I want to ask you, how committed is Congress to keeping the pressure on China and not returning to business as usual when it comes to uh, the CCP, both literally and figuratively. 
Well, the Democrats have proven no interest in that whatsoever. Uh, they don't want to hold China accountable for anything, whether it's uh, origination of COVID or manipulation of their currency or human rights abuses or slave labor with respect to trade or even hold them accountable to the climate change proposal that John Kerry's want the United States to alterly, you know, to, to uh, dramatically alter their uh, manufacturing practices here in the United States. But I can tell you the Republicans are committed to this. We're fed up with China. We're fed up with all the mischief that's taking place in China. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have died. We've had a disrupted economy for nearly two years now because of shenanigans they were pulling in this Wuhan lab. And the fact that the Democrats won't have a single hearing on the origination of COVID or, or any wrongdoing with China is very troubling. The fact that Joe Biden's intelligence community uh, spent almost four months supposedly looking into this and said, oh, we couldn't find a thing. You know, that's not acceptable. So the Republicans are going to keep pressing on this. Hopefully there will be a, a, tie, a day soon when we flip the House, get rid of Nancy Pelosi and get serious about government oversight. Kentucky Congressman James Comer, thank you. Thank you for having me. A group of Republicans is seeking to impeach President Biden. In the newly filed articles of impeachment, the GOP lawmakers say Biden has violated his presidential duties. Four Republican lawmakers introduced three articles of impeachment against President Joe Biden earlier in the week. They cited Biden's mishandling of the southern border, the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, and his attempts to extend the federal eviction moratorium. Ohio Congressman Bob Gibbs is leading the impeachment effort. Congressman Andy Biggs of Arizona, Brian Babin of Texas, and Randy Weber of Texas all signed on as co-sponsors. A recent Gallup poll found more Americans disapproved of the Supreme Court's job. Their approval rating dropped nine points since July. The Gallup poll published Thursday found 40% of Americans disapproved of the Supreme Court. That's the lowest in roughly two decades. And fewer people have a fair amount of trust in the judiciary. The poll was done in early September after the high court declined to block the Texas abortion law. Biden met with leaders from Australia, India, and Japan today, and they all have one thing in common, grappling with a rising China that Biden has accused of coercive economic practices and unsettling military posturing. They made no direct mention of China as they opened the group's first ever in-person meeting, but the world's largest communist nation located in the Pacific was sure to be a major focus driving their meetings. This grouping of democratic partners who share a world view and have a common vision for the future, coming together to uh, take on key challenges of our age. Before they gathered on Friday afternoon, Biden sat down with Prime Minister Modi of India in the Oval Office. He was also to have a one-on-one -on -one with the Japanese Prime Minister. The Japanese and Indian governments welcomed the recent announcement that the U.S., as part of a new alliance with Britain and Australia, would so equip we Australia with nuclear-powered submarines. And that's all for the Capitol Report today. Please don't forget to like and subscribe below. I'm your host, Steve Lance. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time.